I want to welcome you here to Calvary Chapel. If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn your in your Bibles to Exodus 13. We left off with Moses and about two to three million of his Jewish brethren leaving Egypt, heading out into the wilderness, um, and eventually turning a two-week trip to the promised land into a 40-year journey. And so as we look back at chapter 12, we saw the tenth and final plague that God would send upon the Egyptians. Uh, it would be the most brutal of all as he would kill the firstborn of all the animals, but even more importantly, the firstborn in all the households of those in Egypt who did not have the blood of the lamb on their doors, the doorposts and the lintel. Now, it came as a huge shock to Pharaoh. But this was the final plague that would allow, or in a sense, force his hand to finally let the Israelites leave. And his own son, the heir to the throne, he was put to death that night. It all could have been avoided if he would have just humbled himself before the one true living God. But again, how sad, how tragic it is that in his stubbornness, in his pride, in his arrogance, he refused to listen to all the warnings that Moses gave him. And Moses was very clear, if you don't let you know, God's people go, this is what's going to happen. And every time, surprise, surprise, God did exactly what God said he was going to do. And no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Even the servants of Pharaoh were telling him, let the children of Israel go. Come on, Pharaoh, if you don't, we're all going to die. They didn't know the tenth was the final plague. They could have, you know, they might have thought it's going to get even worse than this. But God used that and he lets them go, but it costs them severely. Whoever did not have the blood of the lamb, uh, when the death angel passed over, if they didn't have the blood, the firstborn would be put to death. So what a warning this is to anyone who is running away from, who is rebelling against God today, Yes, God is good. Yes, God is gracious. Yes, God is very patient with us. But if you don't humble yourself before God, He will eventually bring calamity, judgment into your life. If you're a believer and you're rebelling against God, yes, He's just and He's faithful and He will finish what He started, but He also will discipline those whom He loves. So we also saw last time there was a mixed multitude, it says, that came out with the Israelites when they left Egypt. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the mixed multitudes who were primarily half Egyptian, half Jews, did not believe in the one true God, Yahweh. And there were some other tribes that had been captured by the Egyptians, and they looked at this as their get-out-of-jail-free card. And so they were able to flee when the Jews fled, and yet they were part of this mixed multitude that did not believe in the Lord. And they would cause a lot of problems, as we'll see later on, to uh, Moses uh, and also to the other children of Israel. The second half of chapter 12 is where God placed regulations on who could and who could not partake in Passover, the Passover meal. Everyone was welcome to partake, but only if they had to, first of all, put their faith and trust in Yahweh, but then they had to demonstrate that their faith was real by getting circumcised. That is a real commitment. And that is what God required through the Old Covenant, faith in Him and the demonstration of their faith through circumcision. Now, under the New Covenant we have with God, Faith alone is all that is required. Faith alone in Christ alone. That's it. Our faith is revealed to other people by the fact that the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, and then He wants to work through us. He wants to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and that fruit is love. And it's described as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these... Faith, hope, and love is love. In fact, Jesus tells us this is the mark of a true believer. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. And so when I look at that, even as Jesus loves us, we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Apart from the Holy Spirit, that is impossible. It has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love, agape, for one another. And so the old covenant Jews were to make an outward mark on their body to show their love for God. But the new covenant that we have in Jesus is demonstrated by the inward work of the Holy Spirit who's working in us, who's working through our lives. He manifests himself as we walk in the power of the Spirit rather than in the weakness of our flesh. And so let's jump into chapter 13, and um, this will explain the significance of the law of the firstborn, then there's like a parenthesis, he'll go back to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then he'll talk about the law of the firstborn once again. So, chapter 13, verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. So God tells Moses, right at the very beginning of the Exodus here, consecrate or set apart to me whatever opens the womb, the firstborn, both man and animals. Now remember, all the firstborn in Egypt died under that tenth plague that God sent. So it's only fitting that God now tells the Jewish people, I spared your firstborn, but now your firstborn is going to be consecrated, dedicated to me. And as we see throughout the Old Testament, the right of the firstborn uh, there was a very special blessing. He would receive a double portion of the inheritance. He would be the one who would have preeminence and authority over the family after the father passed away. Now, the term firstborn, it does not always refer to the one who was born first. Now, this is very important to take note of. It spoke of the person who had authority and the preeminence over the family. For example, Isaac and Rebecca, they had twins. Who was the firstborn? Esau, you can say it. Who was the secondborn? Jacob. But God would turn it around and he would put Jacob and call him the firstborn. Esau was not the firstborn. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. And then later he complained about it. But then remember when Joseph, he had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, when he was living there in Egypt. And Manasseh was born first, but then Joseph's dad, Jacob, remember he switches, their hand, when he switches his hands on him, and he makes Ephraim the firstborn. So Ephraim would be known as the firstborn not Manasseh, who was born first. Now, it's important to understand that the primary meaning behind this phrase, firstborn, means preeminence and authority. The reason why it's so important is because this is also a title given to Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn. He's the firstborn among the dead. He's the firstborn among those who rise from the dead. And it's very important to understand this. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 15, check it out says of Jesus, he's the, the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It literally means Jesus has preeminence or authority over creation because he is the creator of all things, co-equal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in creation. Now, why is that important? Because some cults will try to use that phrase firstborn to say, Jesus is a created being. God created him first and then used Jesus to create everything else. The thing that Paul says here, the word firstborn, the Greek word is prototokos, and it simply means preeminent one. Or it can also mean one who has the ultimate authority. Well, that's Jesus. If Paul wanted to say Jesus is the one who was created first or made first, born first. He would have used a different Greek word. It's prototiskos. That means first thing made or created. So it's important to understand that because Jesus is not Michael the archangel, as the JWs teach. He is not the spear brother of Lucifer, as the Mormons teach. Jesus is co-creator of all things with the Father and the Spirit. He is the preeminent one. Now, one of the main reasons God tells Moses here to consecrate the firstborn of the animals 
is that it would be a constant reminder to them of what God has done here in setting the captives free, delivering them from their bondage. Because they would celebrate this once a year on Passover with the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but then every time an animal had their firstborn, it would be sacrificed to the Lord. A constant reminder. And he'll even say, when your children ask, why are we doing this? He'll let them know, this was because God delivered us. He struck down the firstborn of the Egyptians, but he set us free. And so it would be a constant reminder of God's grace and his mercy upon the children of Israel. Now we'll see this in greater detail in verse 11. But also through these sacrifices, God is telling the Jewish people, you know, I love you. You are my firstborn. You know how I'll do anything for you. You know how you'll do anything for your children. You'll protect them. You'll, you know, take care of them. You'll provide for them. And that's what God is letting them know. If you do this, then you will realize I love you and I'm, I will provide. And we see a, a simple illustration of this with the Jews when they, um, later on, they're given the, the law where the land was to go Sabbath, uh, a rest of the land every seven years, remember? God will tell them, you can plant and sow for six years, but on that seventh year, you let the land go fallow. Don't do anything, but you can harvest what grows naturally. But don't plant, don't sow, don't do any, you know, reap anything unless it's natural. They didn't do that. They, they almost immediately stopped doing that. God said, if you do this, I will bless that seventh year, even though you're not working. You're letting the land go, you know, fallow. And yet for 490 years, the Jews did not let the land go fallow. So what happened? God says, okay, you owe the land 70 years of rest. That's why they were put into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. God told them, this is why you're doing it. So God's ways are so much better, so much higher than our ways. All these laws he gives them, it was for their benefit. If you obey me, God says, I'll bless you. If you disobey, then you will face the consequences. And so built into their family structure, there's this constant reminder of the power of God to save, to deliver, how he wants to take care of us, how he loves us unconditionally. So look at verse 3. This is a little change in the scenery here. He's going to talk about the, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. So there's a couple of very important points to bring up here. First of all, Moses says, remember this day. Remember what the Lord has done. Remember how he has saved you. Remember how he ha has delivered you. Remember the importance of the blood of the Lamb. That's why the death angel passed over when he saw the blood. Now the Bible is full of verses that encourage us, that exhort us to remember what God has done for us. Even when Jesus is having that final Passover meal with his disciples, and then he institutes what we call the Lord's Supper, communion, it was to be a time of remembrance. I quoted these verses last week because we had communion last week, but 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, Paul tells us what Jesus told him about the Lord's Supper. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new, co uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so he doesn't want us to forget. And it's, I think, well, why would we forget? But we're so prone to forget things. But then there's 2 Peter. Four times in Peter's second epistle, he says, I'm writing these things by way of reminder. I'm letting you know once again. I'm reminding you of these things. Why? Because we, me, I'll say we, I know many of you, <laughs> we often forget the things God wants us to remember, but then we also Remember things God wants us to forget. You know, leave it in the past. Leave it behind. Don't keep bringing things up that God is forgiving you over. We are in a spiritual battle. 
Satan wants us to remember the wicked, sinful things that we did, uh, things that may have been done to us, but God wants us to remember what he did to us and for us by his grace, in his mercy, and his love for us, how he saved us, how he set us free, how he's cleansed us of all of our sins, how he's given us eternal life, he's preparing a place for us in glory. He wants us to remember, think on those things, but forget about all the junk that you used to be involved with. Satan brings up our past to condemn us. The only time the Holy Spirit ever brings up my past is to remind me if I'm starting to do things that aren't right. He'll, he'll say, Jeff, you know what this leads to. This is what I delivered you from. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm thick. And some of you are thick, too. And so God reminds us of these blessings and grace and goodness. And he also reminds us, if you continue to sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. So God is not mocked. Make sure you're listening to the voice of Jesus through the word of God and not to the lies of Satan who wants to steal, kill, and rob you of your joy. Who you listen to, it's so very important. I love what Asaph, he's uh, one of the psalmists, he says this in Psalm uh, 77, verses 11 and 12. He writes, I will remember the works of the Lord. I mean, I love hearing people's testimony that were once in darkness and now they're walking with Jesus. And testimonies can be awesome because we remember the works of God in delivering us and setting us free. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate in all your work and talk of your deeds. In other words, we should get up each morning and say, Lord, thank you for all that you've done for me. Lord, thank you for delivering me from my sins. Thank you, Lord, and help me never forget how good and gracious and merciful and loving you are and how you saved a wretch like me. Now, the other thing I want you to take note of here in verse 3 is that Moses wanted them to remember that it was by the strong hand of the Lord that delivered them from their bondage in Egypt. Again, the power and strength of the hand of God is incredible. Let me go through a few verses here. Isaiah 40, verse 12. It says, Who has measured the waters, speaking of the oceans, in the hollow of his hand? So picture God with his hand like this. You get this hollow, this little cup in your hand. If you you know do that, so all the waters of the world, God can hold in the palm of his hand. It says, uh, measured heaven with a span. What is a span? From your pinky fingertip to your thumb, about nine inches. So God can do that, and his whole hand spans the universe. How big is the universe? I have no idea. Neither do you. Nobody does. I mean, it's, it's incredible, but God's hand, that's how big God is and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. So you think God is all-powerful? Yes, he is. Then we read in this, Colossians 1.17, it says of Jesus, He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Why is that important? Because the word consist means are held together. So in Jesus, he holds it all together. The entire universe is held together. All the galaxies spinning in their orbits, our, you know, gal our solar system spinning in its orbit, it's all because of God. All the little atoms in your body, you know, just spinning in their little orbits, God's got it all held together. A day is coming, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10, where God will let it go. And that's when the whole universe and this planet's going to be vaporized. That's going to be incredible. That's after the Great Tribulation. That's after the thousand-year reign of Christ. But then he's going to create a whole new heaven and earth. It, it, God is just so powerful, so awesome. Yet in John chapter 8, the Pharisees bring this woman caught in the act of adultery, throw her at the feet of Jesus. The law of Moses says we can, you know, we're to condemn such women, I mean to death. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus. And so we read that Jesus stoops on the ground and he begins to write with his finger. Here's the hand of God with his finger writing on the ground. And he's just kind of ignoring them. And then it says in John chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin 
among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down on the, and wrote on the ground. What did he write? I have no idea. Some say maybe he started writing the Ten Commandments. And it says they all started to leave one by one from the oldest to the youngest. Maybe he wrote their name in a little secret sin. Ooh, I better put that rock down because I'm as guilty as she is. She was caught. Maybe I haven't been caught. Well, God sees all. You've been caught. You can't hide anything from God. You know, it's, it's amazing because once they all left, you know, she's standing there with Jesus. Where are your accusers? Is there none to condemn you? No, Lord, not one. Because, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he let her free, but gave her that warning. Don't continue in this sin. I've set you free. Get away from that stuff. The hand of God. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. Jesus speaking says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So God tells Moses, let them know, with a strong, mighty hand, I have delivered you. With the strong, mighty hand that spans the universe, Jesus has you in the palm of his hand, and he won't let you go. That's how much he loves you. He also says the Father has you in his hand, and he won't let you go. Double security. I mean, I don't know. It's amazing. The greatest demonstration, though, to me of his love and the picture of the hands of Jesus is when he's hanging on the cross, the nails driven into his hands, shedding his blood for your sins, for my sins. But the amazing, powerful, loving hands of Jesus. Look at verse 4. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. So this would always be in March or April, uh, the month of Abib, when they'd celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. By the way, when they finally end their 40-year journey, Moses has passed away. Joshua is about to lead them into the promised land. And when God tells him to go into the promised land, you are to slay all of these Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and all the other termites and parasites that are in the land. And literally, that's what it was. Don't think God is a meanie and he wiped out all these tribes. God was very, very patient with them. God told Abraham 500 years before this, this is my land, Israel. I'm giving it to you and to your descendants. The Amorites and all those other ones, the Canaanites, God gave them 400 years to repent of their sins. They were wicked beyond comprehension. We think we're wicked as a nation. We can come up with all kinds of nasty stuff. They were doing nasty, nasty stuff back then. They were even putting their kid, born alive, they'd put the firstborn in the wall of their house when they built their houses. They were sacrificing their kids to Molech and all kinds of horrible things. And they were saying, this will protect us from the evil spirits. I mean, they were just so wicked and corrupt. So God says, you're to wipe them all out because I don't want them infecting you. Because bad company corrupts good morals. Paul warns us as Christians of this same thing. When you're around worldly people, you need to shine the light. You need to be strong in your faith. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 and 34, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good uh, habits. Awake to righteousness. Do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Again, yes, we are in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Read Jesus' prayer there in John 17. When he's talking to the apostles, then he's praying for the disciples. He's praying for all of us. He's leaving us in this world, but he's not going to take us out. But he doesn't want us being part of this sinful world. We're to be influencers. We're to be thermometers, not thermostats in this world. What's that mean? As a thermometer, you're just going with the flow, the temperature of the world around you. You're just going with the flow. Oh, man, I'm with Christians. I'll shine the light. I'm with the unbelievers. I'll dim the light. I'll turn the temperature down. No, we're to be thermostats. 
Set the temperature. We want to be on fire for the Lord. We want others to taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and, glory, and give glory to your Father in heaven. Uh, the Apostle John says this in 1 John 1, starting in verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Take note of that word, cleanses us from all sin. It's in the present tense. I need to be cleansed often. Not resaved. That's not what he's talking about. But when I stumble, when I get in the flesh, when I start thinking wrong thoughts, I need to confess that to the Lord. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But verse 7 says, His blood cleanses us of all sin. That's our present position in Christ. Our position in Christ, I'm justified. I know where I'm going when I die, despite all the issues I have in life today. But I'm in the sanctification process. And in that sanctification process, some of us are more mature than others of us. And so we don't want to look at somebody and say, oh, you're a weak Christian, you're a baby Christian, and get on their case because you're a stronger Christian. No, God is still working on them in that sanctification process. We encourage, we build each other up. All those one another's in the New Testament, I think there's 32 of them. Encourage one another, pray for one another, love one another, be patient with one another. I need to be patient with one another. Some of you... And you're patient with me, I know. So you've been doing this for 34 years, Jeff. It, you got a long way to go. I don't know how much time we got, but yeah, we're all in process. Ultimately, we'll be glorified, but be that as it may. Look at verse 10. Obviously, we're not going through the whole chapter today. Verse, uh, no, where am I? Verse 6. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And again, this is immediately after Passover. And no unleavened bread shall be seen among you, nor, sh nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on the, your hand and as a memorial between your eyes and the Lord and the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Now earlier in chapter 12, God told Moses what the Feast of Unleavened Bread was all about. And now here Moses is telling the Israelites what God told him in chapter 12. This is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about. He's giving these instructions to them. They've been celebrating this feast for like 3,500 years. And it's amazing. And verse 8 is a key element here in the, of this feast. It says, when your children want to know, you know, why are we celebrating this? Why, why are we having this nasty, flat, unfulfilling, tasteless bread. You know, why are we doing this? Make sure you tell them it's because of what the Lord did when he brought us out from Egypt. Again, the leaven represents sin. A little leaven in our lives will spread. It'll start to puff us up. It'll cause us to become proud and arrogant. So get rid of the leaven in your life. Um, the leaven in the bread would cause it to rise and puff up. It takes time, and so you don't have time, Jews. You're going to be fleeing this night, so keep the bread unleavened. But it's also a picture of Jesus. Remember Passover? It points us to Jesus. He is the ultimate final Passover lamb. Unleavened bread. Jesus is sinless. No leaven in him at all. Everyone that tried him, oh, I find no fault in him. He's innocent. Well, he was perfect in every way. And just as the blood of the lamb had to be applied to the doors of every Jewish home in order for them to be safe from the angel of death, so we too must apply the perfect blood of Christ to our lives so that we are cleansed of all sin and made righteous in Christ so we are safe from eternal death. 
And again, unleavened bread, it speaks of Jesus being perfect. We also saw that God wanted the Israelites to leave in a hurry. And this picture is a new life that we have. We come out of bondage. We come into the, the new life we have in the Lord. When we're saved by Jesus, He not only gives us new life, but He also wants us to leave the old leavened life behind, so to speak. Does that make sense? Leave the old behind. 2 Corinthians 5.17 we all know this verse, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's how God sees you, because you are in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The faster we flee and leave the old things behind, the better off we will be. Uh, like the Israelites, we need to leave the world of Egypt in a hurry. Don't take baby steps with sin. If you're doing something you know is wrong, don't think, well, you know, I'll just slowly work my way out of this sin. No, you need to flee. You need to get out. The world is constantly lying to you. Oh, this won't hurt you. Oh, you can indulge yourself. Oh, it's just another time. Yeah, you were okay a month ago, but it's okay. You're, you're good now. Go for the gusto. But what I've learned about my sinful flesh is that it can never be satisfied. My flesh will never say, okay, you just sinned perfectly, Jeff. <laughs> Your flesh will never tell you that. That was the perfect amount of sin. Now I'll not even bother you for the next six months. Your flesh will never say that. you got to reckon the old man dead. you got to take up your cross daily, Jesus says, and follow after me. Deny yourself. My flesh, your flesh, can never be satisfied. That's why Paul wrote what he did, inspired by the Spirit, Romans 6, 7, and 8. Read through there. I mean, there are so many verses that talk about our flesh. Paul says, for I know that in me, and he says, in my flesh dwells no good thing. He says, therefore reckon or consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This verse very important, Romans 8.13, Paul writes, For if you live according to the flesh, and he's talking to Christians here, Romans 8, these are new creations in Christ, these are believers, and if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. You know, you're going to bring just death, destruction, if you continue to live in the flesh. I had someone come up to me after the first service, said, when you quoted that verse, the Lord pierced my heart because I've been living after the flesh for a long time, and, and it, it, this person was broken. It was awesome. I mean, it was like the prodigal son running home to the father because the enemy had been beating them up for so long. You've been blowing it so long. God doesn't want to hear from you. God doesn't love you anymore. That's a lie. God wants you, no matter what you're into, he wants you to repent and turn back to him. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Once again, none of us are perfect. We're all in process. We're all going from glory to greater glory. But oh, how wonderful it is when we put off those things of the world that try and drag us down, that try to pull us down. We put on the things of God, and we walk in that newness of life that Jesus has for us. God wants us to experience joy. He wants us to have that indescribable joy. He wants us to have that peace that surpasses all understanding. He wants us to understand what His unconditional love is all about. He's not holding a string over you with a carrot on it and it's like, go on, just go for it, and then he pulls it away. No, he wants us to rest in him and find our fulfillment in him. That's why we're told so often to put off those things of the flesh because they rob us, they distract us, they hinder us from the intimate relationship Jesus wants to have with us. We don't lose our salvation when we sin, but we hurt, we hinder our relationship, that intimacy with the Lord. It's like in any marriage. If you have a strong marriage and then one of the spouses goes off and does something sinful and wicked, you're still married, but man, the trust has been broken. There's pain, there's hurt. There can be healing and restoration if both parties will humble themselves before the Lord, especially the party that sinned. Paul describes this in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 20. 
But if you have not, uh, but you have not so learned Christ, talking about living fleshly lives as Christians, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Again, God only says these things because he wants the very best for your life. And what is the best that he has for us? A closer, more intimate relationship with Jesus. That's what it all boils down to. Nothing in this life, nothing in this world, nothing the world offers you is worth it if it gets between you and that intimacy that Jesus wants to have with you. And so like the Israelites were instructed by the Lord, get rid of the leaven. Don't let it permeate within your heart or your mind. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Paul tells these boastful, proud believers in the church of Corinth, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you, are, uh, you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Look at verse 11. Here we pick up this whole scenario about the firstborn once again. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey... <laughs> But every, uh, sorry, but every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. Elizabeth's favorite animal is the donkey. Man, you read this and she's like, oh, I'm poor donkey. But you'll break its neck if you don't redeem it. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Again, the firstborn animal, they all belong to the Lord. It would be sacrificed to the Lord. Again, it's interesting. He says the only way you can redeem a donkey is by the death of a lamb, sacrificing a lamb. Isn't that interesting? Think about this. If the lamb represents Jesus, who do you think the donkey represents? You and me. The donkey is mentioned about 150 times in the Old Testament. They were considered unclean animals. In other words, the Jews could not eat them. I remember there was, I won't even mention the restaurant down this way, that was serving horse meat. It was supposedly good cow meat. They got in trouble for it. Man, I love that place. <laughs> I mean, it, it was tasty. But <laughs> then I was like, what? That's not right. But anyway, it's, it's unclean. The Jews could not eat an unclean animal. Donkeys were unclean. You often read in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, you read about donkeys. They were tied up. Many of them were burdened down. They were beaten. They were left in the wilderness. They were lost. They, they would just you know, be kicked, left for dead. One of the last references in the Old Testament about a donkey, it's in Zechariah 9, verse 9. You, you're, you'll know this one. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. <laughs> Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a little donkey, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus fulfilled that prophecy perfectly as he rode that little donkey and entered Jerusalem during his triumphal entry on the day we call Palm Sunday. And so in a similar manner, Jesus will use little donkeys like us, and he'll use us to enter into people's homes, into people's workplaces, 
into schools, CMU. He'll use you in your community as we bring the gospel of Christ to a lost and hurting world that is all around us. But first, the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, had to redeem us. He had to make us clean. He had to untie us, set us free from all the burdens, all the abuse that we took as little donkeys in this world. And so he sets us free. This is one of the reasons Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, burdened down. I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Finally, look at verse 14. I use finally like Paul does in the middle of a letter. And finally, brethren, you're only halfway done, Paul. No, we're, we'll, we'll finish it up here. So it shall be, verse 14, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be a sign, as a sign, on your hand and on the frontlets between your eyes. For by the strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt." So look at verse 16, and then back in verse 9, we have this reference to these things called frontlets between your eyes and on your hands. These would become known as phylacteries. Some of you know what a phylactery is. It was a little leather box, and the Jews, and you'll see it even today, they'll have these little leather boxes, and they usually put them up here, sit on the back of their hand initially, but they'll be on their forearm or right in the middle of their forehead, this leather box, and they have leather straps around their heads. And it was to keep the word of God before their eyes at all times. By the time Jesus shows up and comes on the scene 2,000 years ago, uh, the religious leaders had turned this practice into sort of a competition. They would tie these little leather boxes on their foreheads and on their arms, but as their pride increased, as their hypocrisy grew, their leather boxes got bigger and bigger, and it'd be like a Christmas present on your forehead. And it, it lost all the original meaning. You know, the leather straps that held on these leather boxes on their arms got tighter and tighter. Um, anyway, so when Jesus pronounces the woes on the Pharisees and the scribes, he calls them out for being hypocrites there in Matthew 23. In 23, verse 5, Jesus says, But all their works, speaking of these religious hypocrites, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, that means big, and enlarge the borders of their garments. In other words, they were trying to get the people to look at them and say, Wow, look at the size of that you know, leather box on their forehead. They must be super spiritual. They must be so close to God. And, and these guys are marching around. Yeah, I'm all puffed up and arrogant because they wanted the attention. That's why Jesus says, you are hypocrites. He knew their hearts. He saw through their outward appearance. But this is still very popular in Israel today. Again, we were just there in, May, in March. And by the Wailing Wall especially, you'll see, you know, a lot of the Jewish people have that on their foreheads, tied. Uh, some of the guys, man, I was blown away. It's like, how are your hands should fall off by now? They had those leather straps so, so tight in their arms. I mean, it was cutting in. It's like a tourniquet. In and of itself, that's not a thing that's wrong. It's not a thing that's bad. If their heart is right with God, but unfortunately, no one's heart is right with God unless you're born again, unless you're saved by Jesus. Without Jesus, you cannot be right with God. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, He said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to come to God. And he looks at the heart. He's not looking at the outward appearance. But where does this practice by the Jews come from? Well, we read about it here, but it really boils down to these verses in Deuteronomy 
chapter 6. Let me go through these real quickly with you. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Did, did we get that other verse added? Awesome. Thank you. It says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What is that known as? The Shema. Every Orthodox Jew prays that every single morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is also one of the main reasons why Orthodox Jews reject Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus claimed to be God, come in human flesh. No, the Lord our God is one. You know, we're not going to believe in Him. We believe in God the Father. You're not God. And that's why it says they tried to stone Him and, and kill Him. He says, for what good works are you trying to stone me? Je they said, not because of any good work you do, Jesus, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. They knew exactly what He was saying. He claimed to be God in human flesh. But the Shema actually hints at the Trinity. Notice the word God here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The word God there is Elohim. Why is it important? It's the plural name for God. El is singular, Elah is dual, Elohim is plural. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. So right there we have this hint at the Trinity. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. This should also let the Jews know that the Lord is one because that word is a compound unity. The Hebrew word is ikad, E-C-H-A-D. Ikad, it's a compound unity. It's the exact same word used of Adam and Eve when God says the two become one, ikad, one flesh. Every time we do a wedding, we quote those verses, the two you know, become one flesh because now you're one. That's speaking of God. He is a compound unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one. It's right there, except for there's blinders on. So, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, or 5, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Remember that verse? The lawyer asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of all? And this is what Jesus quoted back to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now look at verse 6. Deuteronomy 6.6 6. And these words which I command you today shall be where? In your heart. That's the most important thing right there. That's the point God is making. Get my word into your heart. Psalm 119, starting in verse 9, it makes it very clear. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's why we read over and over again throughout the Word. Get the Word of God in your heart. Get into the Word, first of all, but then let the Word get into you. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. The world can't get between the spirit and divide that between spirit and soul. Man can speak to you physically. Man can speak to you in your soul, your mind. Only God can make that division into your very spirit. Speak to your heart, your soul, your spirit. Make that division. The Word of God is so powerful. Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, You shall teach them, speaking of God's Word, diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, from the time your children woke up and throughout the day when you're tucking them into bed, let them know about God, His love for them, His power for them, His power to deliver them, His power to keep them safe. If they'll trust Him, God will never leave them or forsake them. He delivered us from you know, the power of the enemy. He's delivered us from slavery. He's brought us into the promised land. And then 
Deuteronomy 6, 8, 9 says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and those shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Some of you have these. What are they called? The little thing on your door? Mezuzahs. Mezuzahs. They, they, they'll put scriptures in there. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's great. It's like some of you are wearing a cross. That's great. Unless it's just become jewelry you know some Jews will walk out of the house they'll slap it they kiss it they'll kiss it on the way out like a good luck charm it doesn't do anything for you he wants the Word of God in your heart he wants Jesus Christ dwelling in you first and foremost this is what it came down to the bottom line is God wants his people to have the Word of God his living word before us and in us at all times What's before your eyes today? I mean, th that was the Word of God. They didn't have TVs. They didn't have, praise the Lord, they didn't have computers and iPhones. Can you imagine wandering in the wilderness for 40 years with iPhones? They'd be looking at their iPhones. They'd be wandering over here and over there. They had to keep their eyes on the cloud, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. They had to go, and the Lord called them to go. Today, man, everybody's on their phones. It's so sad. I was at the doctor's last week. Some of you know Elizabeth got a concussion, and it's been slow healing. But anyway, you're sitting there in the waiting room, and anybody, nobody, I like to talk to people. I'll say, hi, how's it going? You know, just strike up. Everybody's on their phone. There, there's no communication. I'm, you guys are working schools? Oh, my goodness. Way too many Americans have everything in front of their eyes except the Word of God. Then you'll hear them say, but I need to stay connected. To what, your thousand best friends? No, you need to stay connected to Jesus. Satan is having a field day with all of this electronic stuff. Nothing wrong with the electronics, obviously. It's like money. Money's neither good or bad. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. It's just a tool. A lot of us have tools. I got my phone and all that, but be careful. Don't let those things overwhelm you and distract you from that intimacy with Jesus. Let me close with these verses. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. And I promise to close. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, Jesus tells us when all these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draws near. So keep our eyes on Jesus as we live in this fallen world. God wants to use us. We're little donkeys that Jesus wants to use to bring the good news of Jesus to a lost and dying world.